Thank you guys. Awesome worship, you all. Thank you again for escorting us into the throne room of grace. Love being here. Just amazing. In the first service is a, just a real moving prayer time, and a lady just seemed like she had real spiritual breakthrough. And I just, you know, I think about those moments and think, you know, everything about those moments God arranges, and I feel like He, he does so much that we will never know just to show how much He loves us individually. And this morning, who knows, maybe you're here, you got some questions you want answered, and maybe he's going to answer them. Because I know this much, he has for each one of us a story and a mission and a purpose that he wants to see us fulfill. And the best part about it all, he's given us everything we need already. If you have Christ in you, you have everything you need to begin walking that journey. Amen? Well, today we're, we're talking about the three elements that shape our future, and the first one is excellence. Okay? Now, we're talking about excellence individually, excellence corporately. We're talking about organizationally. The elders went away on a retreat, and they decided there's three major elements we want the church to work on this year. One of them is excellence, especially organizational excellence, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And the other two are evangelism and discipleship. And so I get the privilege of kicking off the first one, which is excellence. And before we even talk about the organization, I want us to talk about what that means biblically, how it's applied theologically to every single one of our lives. And then we'll talk about how collectively we can be excellent together, okay? So, if you have a handout, um, you should be, they should be coming around. We'll be using a passage that's just a fantastic. I mean, our God is God. He knew exactly what we needed, and there's a passage that describes the process of excellence this morning we're going to look at, and if you don't have the handout, just keep your hand raised and somebody will bring you one. But throw up that first slide there, Trace. And um, let's look at what the definition is. The Greek biblical meaning of excellence. When you see it stated as in like Philippians 4.8, when it says, you know, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there's anything excellence, if there's any excellence, think on those things. That word means the fulfillment of purpose or function, okay? It means living up to one's potential. And, and it means... Literally, it means just being pleasing to God and of good quality of any kind. So that means that you will have excellence in your life if there's an, an, a quality about you that's good and that points some character of God. Okay, that's, that's how you can be excellent. Is, that's how you can fulfill who God has asked you to be. And the good thing about this, number, let's see, where is it? It's the, the last point there is that this is pro, a process. Yeah. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, instead of some big old leap, it's going to probably be a whole bunch of little steps that you look back over the course of your years and you go, wow, how did that happen? And, and ultimately, it's about daily decisions and it's about choosing what you want more, most, over what you want now. Okay? So, a couple things about it. First, it does not mean that you're perfect. Thank God, right? It doesn't mean perfectionism. It's a long way from all of that. Perfection, or excellence, means that there's grace along the way, that we are going to grow into this, and that we're going to step one step at a time in the journey. Excellence begins with Christ, and it's based on the, in, the character of integrity. We're going to see in this passage here in a minute that it starts deep from within, 
and it should work our way out. Okay. Look at the next one. Excellence without humility becomes what? Arrogance. Right? So remember, who's given us and gifted us and equipped us for this excellence is God. Who should get the glory when we actually see excellence or something good out of our lives? God. And so we're not going to claim any of that as our own. We're not going to act like we're the ones that should own it. We're not going to try to receive the glory from it. In fact, we want to reflect the glory and say, hey, that wasn't me. Anything good you see coming out of me belongs to him. Okay? And we're just going to keep walking it out day by day by day by day. The theologian Frederick Robertson once said, what the world calls virtue is a name and a dream without Christ. Right? Because this cannot happen apart from Christ in us. He says the foundation of all human excellence must be laid deep in the blood of the Redeemer's cross and the power of his resurrection. That's some deep stuff right there, isn't it? So that's when God says to press on the maturity, he's talking about press on to fulfilling all I've asked you to do. When he's saying, you know, this good work that he began in us will be completed until the day of Christ, he's saying all your potential to fulfill everything that I have asked you to do is a day-by-day -day working of my part, and I will bring it to fruition. Okay? So, what are the little things? What are the steps that we can take to build this thing that we call excellence? Well, look at the passage. It's 2 Peter chapter 1, and he gives us a set of steps that we can climb up that lead to us becoming excellent people in an excellent organization as a church. So, let's begin in verse 3. His divine power. Whose power? Jesus. His. That's Christ. Has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So, Hoda, right off the bat, he's saying, look, because of Christ in you, you've already received everything you need for life and godliness that's incredible once you receive christ it's like a seed has been planted deep inside you and everything you need is within it last week we were the staff went to the global leadership summit it's kind of the willow creek thing with bill hybels and it's it was um broadcast by satellite at saint mark and so we went there, and T.D. Jake stood up, and he said, you know, this seed that God has given every one of us, this seed can turn into a tree, but it may also turn into a forest. Nobody knows but God. And our job is to discover what that is from within. You know what it is. You guys are feeling it. I know it because I see so many of you, and I know the passion with which you are pursuing him and that you want to see him glorified in your life. Wouldn't surprise me if we have some forest builders in this church. And I pray that God would nurture and that you would seek him with all your heart to see that grow and lived out in your life. Let's continue on in verse 3. It says, uh, so he's given us all the things that we need pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. Same word. Okay? So who's our example? Christ. There is no better example than, a, than, a, than Christ who fulfilled every purpose that God intended him for. He was perfection. Right? And he did it perfectly so that we wouldn't have to. He did it perfectly so that when we try and fail... He's already paid the price for that mistake. When we, when we try and we miserably, intentionally sin in the process, he already paid that penalty. It's called the blood of Christ. And he pours his grace out on us. But think about what Christ said. He said, 
hey, don't think I came to abolish the law. I didn't abolish it. In fact, I'm fulfilling it. Okay? So Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of a purpose designed by God. That's our example, and he's calling us up to that. He wants you more than anything else to realize, don't waste your life. Don't throw it away on things of this world. Don't get distracted by the things that will burn or that moths will eat or that rust will destroy. He's calling us up to the things that are going to last forever, the things that will make a difference, the things that are in the eternal kingdom that will result in one day when we meet Jesus looking at us going, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know? Amen. He's calling us up to that. That's our Lord. That's Christ. He's our example. And look at this, verse 4. Not only is he calling us up to that, but by which he granted to us through his precious and very great promises. So hold it. He, he not only gave us what we need, but he, he made a whole bunch of promises about what he gave us. So what did he promise? Well, just think about what he said, right? He promised us life. He promised us peace. He promised us joy in the midst of hardship. He promised us provision. He promised us guidance, wisdom, grace, love. He made all of those promises to us. And he wants us to take advantage of them. Why? So that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So he actually wants us to participate in the same nature as Christ himself to show what's actually happened, that we have been rescued and delivered and bought from this life of corruption, from sin itself. Now, look at what he says next in verse 5, because this is where the stair step happens. For this very reason, because God has done all of this for us already, make every effort, that means man, put some energy into this. Take it seriously. Be diligent about this. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. That word virtue, it's the same word as excellence. Same exact word. You can look it up. So essentially he's saying, supplement your faith or out of your faith should come your ability to fulfill whatever it is God has asked you to do. And virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice in verse 8, what he says is this. It doesn't matter how much of this stuff you have. What matters is if you're moving in the right direction. It's not about quantity. It's about quality. It's about direction. Are you moving? Are you stepping towards him? And what he's saying is, hey, doesn't matter how much of it you have, if you got it and you're growing in it, you're not going to be ineffective or unfruitful. In other words, just a little dab will do you, man. You will be both fruitful and effective with just a little bit, one step. brick by brick, step by step. And if you think about all those steps he just said, put that next slide up, Tracy. This is what he said. Now, that word where it says, um, what's it say there? It says uh, that 
that faith supplements, that word supplement means it is the foundation of. It comes, whatever follows comes out of that. So it is literally, he's saying, okay, here are the steps. Climb them. Starts with the fact that I've already given you everything you need. You've got the divine nature of God when you invited Christ into your life. Out of that came, that was a result of faith. It, it causes faith. And out of that should become, one, your ability to fulfill my calling, excellence, virtue. Out of that should come knowledge of who I am, who you are, who God is what I've asked you to do in this life, what this world is even about. And out of that knowledge should come a willingness to make decisions today that are long-term. Again, it's choosing between what you want now and what you want most. That's going to take self-control, disciplined living. And out of that comes perseverance. Which means there will be obstacles. Which means at some point you are going to want to quit. And he's saying, don't do it. Keep taking the next step. Because out of that comes godliness. And people will see your proven character. And then, look what happens. The last two are all about loving others. First one, kindness, that's the word for that's the word phileo, so it's brotherly love. And then comes agape, the highest step, unconditional love for others. Okay, so it starts from deep within, kind of wells up within us, works its way out, and eventually, hey, we're doing things with people that we never thought even possible out of our lives. And we're fulfilling everything God has asked us and desired out of us. Now, who knows? Maybe this will be you leaving academics to come pastor a church in Little Rock. But maybe it's you packing up everything you own and moving from Atlanta to Little Rock because you think God is at work here. Or coming here to study law only to find out there's a ministry here and you become a youth pastor or all these different stories that show this incredibly powerful sovereign hand of God at work. And he may actually want to fulfill this great calling of yours as you do nothing but raise your children in godliness. You just don't know. But he does. And our desire should be to find out what that is. So, notice that the last two become about others, and this is where collectively we as a body can become more excellent together. Okay, so what are the small things we could do that would really improve the mission, the purpose of the church? Well, just as God would have it, I went to a, a wedding, a family wedding last May, and on this side of my family is like where my Christian heritage comes from. My mother's side of family, first Christians go back to the mid-1800s in China. Got like six generations that wind their way all throughout history. They came over to the U.S. in 1897, went back to China, then came back again. And I mean, it's just an amazing story. But one thing that's I'm really amazing about it is how God has favored that side of the family. There's like 18 doctors, medical doctors. I mean, there's doctors married to doctors who've had children who all become doctors and who all marry doctors. I mean, it's that kind of thing. It's like, where did all these doctors come from? But it's really true. It's just an amazing part of my heritage. And one of my cousins is a doctor, of course. He's married to a doctor, and he happens to be the chief medical officer of one of the most prestigious hospitals in Cleveland. And when we were having our conversation at this wedding, we had about an hour to kill, so we were just shooting the breeze. And I said, hey, it turns out that he's not only the chief medical officer, he's also the chief quality officer whose task it is to make sure that regardless of how much money that the hospital has, that 
everybody had, receives the highest quality medical care. Okay? And so I said, hey, tell me your secrets. <laughs> the elders have said, we need to become more excellent as a church. What does it look like? Have you influenced it? Tell me what you think your philosophy of it. He goes, well, here's my favorite story. He goes, when I first started, we had an infectious disease rate within the hospital itself that went totally against our mission, right? So that means people come to the hospital for one thing, but they get sick from an infection that's being passed around within the hospital. Okay, that's called an infectious disease, like staph infection. You guys know that if you've ever spent any time in the hospital, you know how bad that is and how difficult it is to stop. So he said, what I did was I, I wanted to rid that and really make a difference on that, and I knew that it was largely focused on hand washing. Right? You would think that doctors, nurses, staff at a hospital would know that. And he's like, so I had to find out just how much do they really know it and how much are they really doing it and all that data. So I first got online and I found out that hospitals across America, that the average hand washing rate was 55%. So 45% of the time, the medical professionals and staff were not washing their hands, and so that spread diseases even within their own hospital. It went totally against the very mission of the, of the hospital. So he goes, I didn't know what ours was, and I had to find out what it was. So you know what I did? I hired a bunch of college students and put white robes on them and put clipboards in their hands, and I made them go stand around, and all they do was count people washing their hands. I made them, I made them count at least this many times to make sure it's a statistically accurate survey. And I found out what the rate was of hand washing in our whole hospital. He said, you want to know what it was? And I said, what? It's 55%, the national average. So I called the staff meeting and I told everybody, we're done with hand washing campaigns. We're not going to put posters up anymore. I'm not going to try to rah-rah you into it, but you need to know I've hired a bunch of students, they've got white robes on, and all they're doing is they're just going to be walking around and seeing if you wash your hands, and they're going to report back to me, and I'm going to report to the whole hospital which wings are washing their hands and which ones aren't. He said the hand washing rate went from 55 to 80, like overnight, because people knew they were being washed, right? <laughs> and then he turned it into this friendly competition where every week he was like, posting this wing at 90%, but this one then listed him in order. And people started like taking some pride in their hand washing, like, yeah, we're like the best hand washing unit in the hospital. And others were like, that's not fair, because other people are coming onto our wing and they're not washing their hands. And he was like, no, that's no excuse, because every one of you should be holding each other accountable. And when you see somebody not washing their hands, I want you to say this, hey, don't forget, Wash in, wash out. It's like Karate Kid or something. You know, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, that is brilliant. How can I use that at church? You know, but anyway, so they kept doing it. They got the entire hospital into the mid 90s. And the only time he needed to know if somebody wasn't washing their hands is if they have been reminded and they still didn't do it. And then he would call them up and say, This is your friendly chief medical officer, <laughs> you know, and then he would say, you know, I know you know why it's important, and I'd really not like to have this conversation again. And the doctor would say, yes, sir. <laughs> and I said, what'd that do to your infection rate? He goes, it cut them in half. And I said, how'd the hospital respond? He goes, we celebrated and we partied over the reduction in the infectious diseases by half, and it's been like that for over six years. Yeah, that's a great story, isn't it? I have to tell him to watch this sermon now. You go clap for him. <laughs> but I came back and I wondered, what's our hand washing? What is something that all of us could do that if we all did it, well, first of all, if we're not all doing it, it goes against our mission. And if we are doing it, it would propel us forward. I think I figured out what it is. You know what it is? It's giving. And so the first thing I did, I was like, how can I find out? 
what's our giving rate? And I actually went for the first time, and there's actually, you know, not, I didn't look at records of individuals, there's, but our uh, database will tell you in any given month how many families gave and what the average gift was. Doesn't attach any names or anything. You know how many people support the church over the course of one month? About 150 families. So that's great. Hey, thank God for 150 families supporting the life of the church. But then I thought, well, who knows? Maybe that's 10% of the families of Mosaic. So I had to find out how many families come here on an average month. And the number is 260. You know what the giving rate of the families are at Mosaic Church month to month? 55%. <laughs> I am not making that up. How crazy is that? That after all of that is 55%. So maybe giving and hand washing go hand in hand somewhere. I don't know. I can figure it out. But still, thank God for the 55%. When we would not have made it this far without you. I sincerely, the elders from the bottom of our hearts, say thank you. Because we know there's some real sacrificial giving in that 55%. But just imagine. Imagine what life would be like if we raised that from 55% of the families giving to the church to mid-high 90s. That would change the, the life as we know it. You know, we do a lot with a little around here, right? Most of our money goes to staff. An increasing amount goes to the facilities. And, and then we have some for ministry. And let me tell you, we do a lot with what we have. We've been very, very faithful in the little things. But there's times where we want to do something, we can't do it. It's because we just... It's not the right time. It's like, we'll just keep holding on to that dream, right? But just imagine if we did the same thing and the giving rate went up. That would change the way we do ministry. It would propel us forward in so many ways, it wouldn't even be funny. And so, if you're not giving, let me invite you very earnestly, extremely humbly, I know how much life pressure puts on you. But let me invite you to start. And if you're given inconsistently, let me encourage you to give consistently. And if you're given consistently, let me encourage you to give sacrificially. And if you're already given sacrificially, God bless you. <laughs> we thank God for you and know that God is using you. You know, I travel around with John Harrison, and we go into a lot of companies, and I talk to him about building leaders that last. And I use this example of this cup, and I learned it from the guy that did the seven, you know, there's a seven habits of the most effective people, you know that one, that swept through the business world in the 90s. And he starts with an empty cup, and he puts these big rocks in it, and he's doing it for these college students. And he says, is this full? And the college students go, yeah, it's full. Then he takes a handful of gravel and he puts that down in the cup and shakes it around and then says, okay, and now is it full? And they go, yeah, it's full. Then he takes hand, sand and he kind of drips sand down into it, shakes it around and goes, now is it full? And they're going, mm, maybe not. And then, then he takes a glass of water and he fills the rest of it up all the way to the brim so that there's obviously no room left in the cup. And he goes, now is it full? And of course, the college students say, yes. So then he says, so what's the point? And the young idealistic college students yelled out, that just when you think your life is full, you can always cram more stuff into it. <laughs> Those college students, and, you know, of course not. And he's going, no, the point is this. You don't put the big rocks in, you will never get them in at all. And that's the way giving is. This is a rule of life in my house with my daughters. I say, look, always, always put the big stuff in first. 
And it doesn't matter if you're loading the dishwasher, if you're packing your car up for college, if you're managing your schedule, and especially if you're balancing your checkbook. You get those big things in first or they won't go in at all. So I'm encouraging all of us, let's put the big things in first. Let's live the life that God desires so that we will become the church he wants us to become collectively. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing that you can do, and I'm going to tell you what you can expect from us in a minute as well as, as church leadership, but another thing that would be good for everybody to do that would really help propel the mission forward and keep us from having to go back and retreat would be the way we deal with conflict. Okay? So remember this. In this church, you've heard me say it before. For those of you who are new, you may have never heard it, but just remember it because it's really critical if you're going to be part of this church. There's 35 nations represented. There's rich, there's poor, there's young, there's old, there's, you know, people with advanced degrees, there's people with no high school, that haven't even graduated high school, there's people that are super powerful, and those that are probably live in a tent back here behind McDonald's, you know, and so we have everything, and there's a very, very good chance that somewhere along the road, you are going to offend somebody or be offended by somebody. Because we're so different and we see life so differently and so it's critical that when that happens that all of us commit to the process of seeing these conflicts restored resolved and what that means is that if you get offended the first thing you shouldn't do is pick up the phone and call your 10 best friends and say hey guess what happened to me today and who did this and what they said trying to build your own coalition, right? That's divisive. It's actually evil. But it's a very natural thing to do. I understand that. Because my flesh wants to do it too. But what God asks us to do is to go to that person. You know, in the Gospels it says it happens both ways. It says if you're offended go to the person that offended you. It also says, if you offend somebody, go to the person you offended. Right? So no matter which one you are, you don't have an excuse. He's asking you to go to that person in hopes that one of the two are godly enough to come together and try to resolve this so that restoration happens to the relationship. That's critical. And so, if everybody would do that, boy, that would make life a lot better. <laughs> so much of my time wouldn't be spent trying to resolve things that shouldn't have to be resolved because they were handled in a godly manner. Just remember, the end result of every conflict is not that you prove yourself right. It's not that the other person even realizes what's wrong. Or that you get to lay a guilt trip on somebody or you get to vent finally and tell them how frustrated you were. It is the restoration of the relationship. That is the bottom line. That should be the end goal of every time there's a conflict. You should keep short accounts and be intentional about getting those things solved. And if you don't, it'll pull away from the mission. And if you do, it'll propel us to oneness. Now, what can you expect from your leaders in terms of excellence? We thought about this, and we've been working on this. One is you should expect of us that we will be approachable and accessible and humble. Okay? there's issues, don't be afraid. You can call us, you can text us, we'll come meet you. I can tell you one thing, I mean, I wish you guys could see the inner workings of an elders meeting where we sit around the table and we hash things out. We had a three-hour discussion last Wednesday and it was rich and deep and there were opinions from all possible perspectives. 
But man, when we, when we get to a point of unity, it's an amazing thing. Okay? And one thing that was said in the, in the elders meeting was, look, what you think personally about an issue doesn't matter. What matters is what we collectively think as a group. Okay? And we as a group are committed to shepherding a very, very diverse group of people. So we want to know I and mean, come. Don't be afraid. We will receive you. Another thing you want you to know is that we are improving our accountability. Okay? I pretty much meet with all the staff now every week. And I have a little pad of paper in my office, and we basically go over all these things every week. You know, that's, that's taken me years of maturity to get to, step by step. You know? And so we're improving as a church. We want you to know that. You can expect that out of us. We'll, be more, we'll try to be more consistent in the way we communicate, in the way that we um, organize the church. But the thing is, it's a process. Day by day, daily decision, step by step, brick by brick, for his glory and his glory alone. Amen? So, what are the takeaways? Um, be, be one with us, you know? The best thing you could do giving-wise is go online and just set it and forget it. You know, you don't have to worry about whether or not you have checks. Aaron was sitting outside in between services saying... I don't have to remember if I have to brought my checkbook. I don't remember if I have to have checks in it. I don't remember if how much money, you know, that, that I give last week. I just, when I do my online stuff, it's set, and I don't have to think about it anymore. And it gives me great joy when I see the statement. Yeah. So we have a bunch of ways for you to give. You can go online. You can do that text to give thing. There's a kiosk out there. You can do whatever you want to do, but just make it part of your growing experience because stewardship is a very large part of maturity as a believer. So, let me pray for us. We're going to um, observe communion and the fact that Christ did for us all that we needed. And so let's pray and begin that process. Lord, we thank you so much that you are our greatest example. We thank you that you denied yourself all for our sake. There's nothing that you didn't give on behalf of us. We receive that, and we're so grateful. And so would you encourage every person today, especially those who know that there's more to life than what they're living, and they, they know there's this deep yearning from within that there's something else, and they, they're not even sure what to do with it. Well, I pray you would bring that to fruition and that every day you would make it just a little bit clearer, that you would make that draw a little bit stronger and that one day they'd be able to look back and go, wow, how did that happen? That's amazing. And so let's celebrate who Christ is in this moment. I'm going to have all the communion servers come forward and get their supplies ready. You sit and reflect for just a moment and then come forward and receive your elements. And then once you receive your elements, go back to your seat. We'll take communion together as one body, as a, again, a show of our unity. And then we'll continue on from there. So as soon as your servers are, are here, you feel free to come forward and partake of your elements.
Come on.